thank you, John. Well, as I say, it's lovely to be with you and um, to have the opportunity to join with you next week as well. And uh, what I'd like to do tonight and next week is um, look at a couple of passages from, first of all, the life of Elijah this week. And um, we'll look at the life of Elisha next week. And I think next week um, I would describe our passage as one of the strangest, if not the strangest stories in the, or one of the strangest stories, certainly in the Old Testament. And we'll look at an incident in the life of Elisha next week. But this evening, it would be very helpful if you could have a Bible in front of you and turn with me to um, 1 Kings chapter 17. And uh, I was wondering how to do this, but I think probably the easiest thing to do would frankly just be to read the text. Um, and then we'll go back and um, we'll just work our way through it as we go. So this is 1 Kings 17 and we'll read the whole chapter. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord the God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except by my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. <coughs> I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said. But first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord. O oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him 
and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He took him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. And then if I may, I just want to read another text. Again, this is one that we'll be familiar with. You don't need to turn to it. Um, but it's in James chapter 5 and verse 17. And we read this. The Apostle James writes, Elijah was a man just like us. Now, the Greek there it might be translated, he felt just like us. In our older Bibles, it will say something like he had passions like us. He, he faced the same sort of challenges, the same sort of things. He reacted in the same way as we do, is really what James is saying. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Elijah is certainly, I think, one of the key characters of the whole of Scripture, particularly in the New Testament. He's, he's regularly referred to, and we do well to consider his life and the things that he faced and did, because I think there are many lessons that he has to teach us. Now, <clears throat> Hank and I didn't confer this evening, but what he said earlier on fits very well with what I want to share with you this evening. Because in some respects, this is a chapter about trials and facing difficulties. And I think God has quite a number of things to say to us just as we look through this text. And hopefully this evening we can together learn some important lessons. Now, <clears throat> in the text, Elijah just suddenly appears on the scene. We're told he lived in Tishbe in Gilead. We've got really no introduction, nothing about his youth, where he was born, his parenthood, nothing like that. He just appears suddenly in the text. And we're told that God sends him to speak to a wicked king called Ahab. And the message that um, Elijah is directed to bring is that there's going to be no rain or even dew on the land of Israel for the next few years until Elijah says this um, drought will come to an end. Now, of course, it's always wise to have a little look at what the context of any text is and to have a think about why all of a sudden this man should appear on the scene with this particular um, uh, 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 warning to the king of Israel. If you read chapter 16, what you discover is there's a new king in town. His name is Ahab. We are again very familiar with him. He's a famous character as one of Israel's most wicked and ungodly leaders. And even worse, he had a wife that made him look like a Sunday school teacher, Jezebel. And um, as a result, probably of Jezebel's influence, Baal worship for the first time was introduced into um, Israel. Now, it was certainly not the first time that Israel had been exposed to um, idolatry, but this was a new God, and it was one that seemed particularly opposed um, to the God of Israel and the, the truth that surrounded him. And Baal was essentially um, a fertility God. I, I, it was a cult. And um, of course, in the ancient world, and particularly in that part of the world, if the ground was to be fertile, the one thing it would need was rain. And God sends his prophet along to say, you might think that this new God of yours is all powerful. But just let me show you 
how inept he actually is because I'm the real God of Israel. I'm the true God of Israel and I'm going to stop the rain. And you can worship this fertility goddess, God, all you like. But ultimately, Israel, the world is in my hands. And that's the context of the passage that we've read. And of course, this was in keeping with the warning that God gave to Moses way back in Deuteronomy 11. When God said, look, as a nation, if you follow me, if you worship me, you're going to be blessed. But if you don't, the curses will follow. And one of those curses would be that there will be no rain. So it's kind of important that we understand what's going on here. There's a conflict and God is bringing judgment on Israel for departing from its true worship of him and um, uh, in bringing one of the promised curses upon Israel, that there would be drought, there would be no rain as a result of their disobedience. Now, can I just say in passing, it would be very easy for us to sit here in judgment over Israel. And certainly as a boy, I remember reading these stories, particularly about Elijah and the prophets of Baal and thinking what a strange world they live in, how crazy those people are. But believe you me, our culture is descending into things that are not so far removed from the Baal worship of ancient Israel. In Edinburgh now, there are two neo-pagan festivals every year. The first one is on the 1st of May, May Day. It's called the Beltane Festival. And it started off as a relatively small gathering of pagans. Now, if you want a ticket, it's the most popular ticket in town. It, it sold out almost instantly. And 10,000 people gather on the Colton Hill in Edinburgh to watch half-naked people with painted bodies dance around and bring in the summer. And just there on the 31st of October, they have their other fire festival. I think it's called, I think it's Sein Huin is what it's called. And I was just looking at their website as I was preparing this message. And this is what it says. Now, of course, this is Halloween. And the first thing that struck me was they said, all the tickets are sold. 10,000 will be there. Please don't come. There's no more room. And by the way, next year, we're hoping to move this to Holyrood Park, where more thousands can gather to celebrate this. But listen to what it says. This is what they said on their website. The story follows the overthrowing of summer by winter with a dramatic standoff between the summer and winter kings. This is overseen by the Kelech, a Celtic representation of the goddess or the divine hag who ultimately decides each king's fate and ushers in the looming colder months. Now, it's hard to believe that thousands and thousands of my fellow citizens want to gather for that kind of festival. So don't think that we are so far removed from these things that were going on in pagan Israel. These things are now here and they're popular and they're growing. Now, let's have a look at our text and see what happens. There, there are some things here that I'm going to infer, but we're told in James that Elijah was a man just like us. And I'm assuming, therefore, that as I look at this and think, how would I react, that Elijah may perhaps have reacted in the same way. The text opens and evidently God has sent Elijah to go and confront Ahab and tells Elijah, go off and you and by the way, when I turn the taps on Elijah, I'll let you know and you can let him know. Now, I think there's part of me, if God came to me with that kind of message, I would be kind of excited. 
I'm going to confront the authorities. I'll sort them out, Lord. Let me in there. And uh, I'll make sure your message is plainly declared. That's what Elijah does. But look what happens next. It says, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here. Turn eastward and hide in the Kerith ravine. And I was thinking, I can just see Elijah thinking, Lord, you, you, I've just been told to confront the king. You've given me great authority and power. And now you're telling me to go and hide. What on earth are you doing? And although we have to work out a little bit here, he, he's sending them to the back of beyond. And he's thinking, Lord, should I not be where the action is? You know, I'm the one that's brought this message. I'm going to have to be around when the rain is going to start. And now you're telling me like some sort of lame duck, some frightened wee boy to go and hide in a ravine away on the east of the Jordan. And I, I wonder if Elijah was a little frustrated, wondering, perplexed at what God was doing. Now, this is a, a text that has a lot to say for those of us who are perplexed and asking, Lord, why is this happening? Or why have you allowed this? But you know the story well, I'm sure God sends him to hide. Now, of course, where God hides us, we're at our safest. There was a book I read, I think, just as a, as a young teenager, maybe not even that age, some of you will remember it called The Hiding Place by Corrie Ten Boom as she relayed her frightening story about the Holocaust and what was done by her family to save some of the Jews and the cost that her family paid for that. And of course, the title of her book is very clever because, yes, the Ten Boom family had a hiding place. Um, in their house where they hid many Jews and preserved their lives. But that's not really the hiding place that the book is about. She's talking about the hiding place ultimately being God himself and the Lord Jesus. He is our hiding place. That's where we're our safest when we are hidden with him. But it's interesting, that's the first thing he's told. Here's this, you know, He's been sitting quietly in a corner for years and years and years. And God says, confront the king. And then he says, now I want you to scarper and go and hide in a ravine out east. And then we're told how God provides for him. And again, it's somewhat amazing. God says, listen, I want you to, to stay in this ravine. And uh, I'm going to, or I've ordered the ravens to feed you there. Now, again, if I had been Elijah, I'd be saying, what? Um, I don't know an awful lot about ravens, to be honest with you. Um, but it's not the kind of bird I would want to feed me. Um, as you know, John Langlands and I share the same grandchildren, and one of them is very keen on sheep. And at lambing time, the one thing Oliver has got to do is keep the ravens away from the lambs. Um, because the ravens wait for the lambs to be born, peck their eyes out, and then eat their tongues, quite literally. It, it's not the kind of bird that, frankly, I would want to be bringing my breakfast and evening meal. And I wonder what Elijah said about that. But nevertheless, we read that God brought, or through the ravens, God brought him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. And he was able to drink from the brook. Now, first of all, that might not be a very attractive lifestyle, but it has a certain attraction. I can sit back here and I'm getting a takeaway every day. I, I, in those days, you would have to go out in the fields, um, kill your animal, prepare your meat. It was a big job. And here, as I say, the Old Testament um, version of Deliveroo was coming to Elijah every day. And I suspect, like me, there would be part of this thinking, you know, um, the grub's not too bad and um, I could get used to this lifestyle. 
And uh, no doubt Elijah would be amazed as this miraculous event took place before his very eyes twice a day. But then we read, and later the brook dried up. And I was thinking, I wonder why that is. Why, you know, why did God decide to move Elijah? And I'm sure Elijah must have been thinking the same thing. And, you know, very often I think God maybe does that in our lives. He brings change. Because sometimes we can be, how can I put it, more possessed by the means that God uses than by God himself. You know, after a while, I'm sure Elijah, first of all, would be taking it kind of for granted. Maybe not. Maybe it seemed every day it was remarkable to him and he'd be thanking God for another meal. But it's very easy to be taken up with the means by which God feeds us rather than think that he's the one who ultimately provides. And maybe there's been times in your life where a job has been lost or there's been financial difficulty. And it's very easy then to wonder how God is going to provide. But I'm sure your testimony will be that amazingly he does. It's astonishing how God allows these things to come into our lives, these difficulties, these changes. And I think he allows that so that we don't become possessed by the means but rather possessed by him himself. So we read in verse seven, sometime later, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. So no water. Where am I going to go now, Lord? And the word of the Lord comes to him. Go at once to Zarephath and stay there. Now, again, um, because well, certainly maybe not for you, but for me, I'm not particularly familiar with the geography of ancient Israel, but he's in the east and now he's told to go west. And again, I could hear myself saying, Lord, what on earth are you doing? You've sent me over to one end of the country. Now I'm having to go to another. And uh, God tells him to go there at once. And then he says, I've commanded a widow in that place to supply your food. Now, I wonder what you would have thought. I think I might have been thinking um, a widow. Well, there are a few wealthy widows out there. And, you know, this uh, thing about the ravens and the bread. Well, it, it would be nice to have a proper roof over my head and maybe a few servants to look after me and maybe enjoy the comforts of life. And thank you, Lord, for these difficulties but I know now, Lord, that you're going to make things a bit easier. And I'm sure this lady will be wealthy enough to give me a much higher standard of living than the one I'm currently enjoying. Maybe that's what went through his mind. It's what would have gone through mine. I'm going for a step up I'm out of the ravine, away from the ravens. And I'm going to get some proper meals, some proper grub for a change. So we read that he went to Sarafeth and he came to the town gate. And a widow was there gathering sticks. Now, again, we don't get really the full force of this. But um, in those days, if you were doing well, you wouldn't be gathering sticks. Um, you'd be chopping wood and dragging logs home for a good roaring fire. The fact that she was gathering sticks probably means she was poor. Probably she wasn't all that strong because she couldn't carry wood. She could only carry um, a few bundles of sticks. And as you and I know, um, if you want your log fire to burn for any length of time, you need a bit more than just kindling. So you can see Elijah lands in Zarephath and he thinks, oh, no, Lord, not this widow. Surely. The Surely this isn't the one, the one gathering the sticks. And then she says, he, he asks, first of all, for her to bring a little water. And uh, as she's going for the drink, he says, and could you bring me some bread? 
Now, this is a really important te text. The next verse sort of is what the whole passage in some respects turns on. What the woman says is, look at it in verse 12, as surely as the Lord your God lives. So she seems to recognize that um, Elijah was a prophet of God. Um, but it was his God, not hers. And she replies, I don't have any bread. I've only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug, and I'm gathering a few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. What a predicament to be in. And Elijah's thinking, is this, is this how God is going to provide for me? This time I've been better back in the ravine with the ravens. But that's not what he says. First of all, and by the way, the bit about, you know, I'm going back home or going to have our last meal and then my son and I are going to die is very significant as to where the story goes. But look what Elijah says to her. He says, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said, but first make a small cake of bread for me and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. Now think about that for a moment. This woman says, we've got enough for a last meal. And Elijah says, I want you to share it with me. That was quite a request that he was making. But then he says this in verse 14, for this is what the Lord. Now look, she talks about Elijah, it's your God. But Elijah in verse 14 says, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run, run dry until the Lord gives rain on the land. Now, what this text is about and what I'll be saying as we summarise it. It's about people who are facing huge challenges of life, but they decide to trust God and God blesses, even in a situation where it's the last thing common sense would tell you to do. I mean, imagine what you would think. You've got your last little handful of flour, a little oil to cook with it. And he says, I want you to make a meal for three rather than two. And by the way, that flour and that oil will be an unending supply until the drought's over. What would you do? I think I'd send him packing and tell him, are you mad? But it says she went her way and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up. And the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. There was something else that occurred to me as I was reading this, and it's this. When our kids were young, they learned not to say to their mum, mum, that was really good. I enjoyed it. Because the problem was, if you said that, you got the same meal for a month. So if mum ever said, what did you think of that? Oh, 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 they didn't want to be too enthusiastic about it. Otherwise, it would get a bit monotonous if you were getting the same meal time and time again because you said you had enjoyed it. Now think about this family. Every day, the same bread cooked in the same oil for years and years and years as this drought went on. And the food must have been a little bit monotonous, but it was that that sustained them when all the world around them was dying. And, you know, I thought about our situation spiritually. You know, what does God ask us to do? I was thinking about the bread, first of all. And remember when the devil came to tempt the Lord Jesus, the Lord had to respond. Remember, he said, make the stones into bread. And the Lord responded, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
And of course, Jesus himself talks about himself as the living bread. But I wonder if, in a sense, the living bread is displayed in the written word of God, which is like bread to our souls. It sustains us. And, you know, there are plenty out there who will say, that's a bit monotonous. I'm looking for a bit of excitement. You know, we could do with spicing up our meetings. Why is it we just end up talking about this book all the time? Could we not have a bit of variety? Could we not have this? Could we not have that? Could we not have something on top of it? But this is the bread that sustains us. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And it's perhaps a little easy for us sometimes to think as we continually feed on God's word, this is a bit monotonous. But listen, when the rest of the world around us is dying, this is where our real sustenance is drawn from. This is where our, 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 our survival will be and be brought about as we consider the word of God together. And then I was thinking about the oil. And many of you, I know, will immediately know that in the scripture, oil represents the Holy Spirit. And of course, those two things come together, the word and the spirit. The big danger is that you separate one from the other. It is God's word as illuminated by his spirit. And it would be very easy for us, perhaps, to think this is getting a bit monotonous. But um, that's how God works. We need the bread and we need the oil. Now, it's amazing as we read on the story because this woman here, she thinks, remember, she's going home to die. She and her son. And God gives a promise. And I think we have to read into the text a little bit that what Elijah was saying to the woman in verse 13, when he says, don't be afraid, he was saying, listen, your son is not going to die. You're not going home for your last meal to starve to death. But God is going to provide for you and your son and you will see out this drought and you will survive it until the rain comes. I think that's inferred from the text. God, through Elijah, makes a promise to the woman. And then what happens? We read in verse 17, sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. And we read he grew worse and worse. It sounds like COVID or something similar. And it says he stopped breathing and he died. Now, what would you say if you were that woman? I think I'd be saying to Elijah, some, so much for your God. You brought him here. He, 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 he can fill vessels with flour and, 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 and oil. But what's the good of that now that my son is dead? I think a lot of people would have reacted with great bitterness. But look how she reacts. She says at the end of verse 17, did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? She doesn't in any way blame God, but she recognizes that she's a sinner. She recognises who God is and that she is sinful in his sight. And I think that's a significant reaction. She may be, she may have been, and I'm sure she was, completely bewildered by what was going on. And so is Elijah to some extent. In verse 19, the boy is handed over and Elijah takes him up to the room where he was living at the top of the house. And it's interesting, look at verse 20, it says, then he cried out to the Lord, and he does that again, twice. And we read in verse 22 that God heard his cry. But it's interesting how he prays, and I think there's a lesson here. Look, he places himself in the, in the woman's situation. He says in verse 20, oh Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also? Upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die. 
he identified with her tragedy. And maybe when we're praying for others, I wonder, do we do that enough? Do we really understand sometimes what people are going through that we can cry to the Lord for them? And then we read that he stretched himself out three times and the boy's life returned. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy was literally raised from the dead and handed back to his mother. And our text finishes with this. Now I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Now, the number three is the number of resurrection. And I wonder if the Holy Spirit is just giving us a model here. You see, what happened to the woman? There were great miracles taking place every day in her house as that food was provided for. Day by day by day, month by month, literally year upon year. But what brought her? to faith in the God of Israel was the resurrection of her son. And of course, in a sense, is that not true for us as well? That when it comes to the Lord Jesus and we think about the promises that he has made, could we not write the text this way? Now I know as a result of his rising from the dead, now I know that you are the son of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. I think we have at the end here just a wonderful Old Testament picture of the Lord Jesus and how our faith is based on his resurrection. Now, if you think about this text, all the way through, there are people who are facing things which perplex them. It, it, it starts with, you know, a hero moment for Elijah when he's confronting the king and bringing judgment on the nation. And then he's away hiding. And then ravens are coming to feed him. And just when he's getting comfortable, God says, I'm going to move you. And by the way, I'm going, here he ends up in a situation with some poor soul that can't even feed herself. And then ultimately we read of that woman's, I, I mean, imagine how it must have been for her. Where she sees the oil and the flour flow every day. And that was the means by which God was going to provide and preserve the life of her and her son. And he dies. It must have been very, very perplexing. But Elijah, I think, prays in response to God's great promise of their survival. And as a result of that, God fulfills his promise. And the lad sees that, um, uh, that drought through just as God had told his mother through the prophet Elijah. And I think, first of all, this is a great passage on whatever we're facing, whatever it is we have to deal with just now, whatever perplexes us, and I think Hank mentioned a few things. Some of us are worried about health. Some of us are worried about getting old and our future. Some of us are concerned maybe for others who are infirm. Or we're worried about members of our family and where they are spiritually. All of these things that perplex us. And we are baffled by what God is doing. But what this passage really teaches us. listen. Whatever is happening in your life, you can trust God. That's what each of these individuals did. God says to Elijah, I want you to go to the ravine. I want you to hide there. He went. He went to a widow woman who clearly within her own power and strength and ability could not provide for him. But God did. And ultimately, we see the Lord's power over sin and over death in that final vignette of the of the passage. So what is this passage saying to us? Because I suggest it's this, that whatever our situation, whatever it might be, we need to trust God and his promises. How does the text end? I know that the Lord, I know that the word of the Lord from your mouth 
is truth. I think what she was saying was this, when God makes a promise, he will keep it. So whatever you're facing at the moment, whatever your struggle is, whatever your trial is, and we all have them, the issue is, are we prepared to trust God in these baffling moments of life? Just in closing, I was reminded of this hymn. You'll all know it, but let me just quote it to you. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting him whatever befall, trusting Jesus, that is all. Amen. And may God bless us all as we go into another week and may help us to trust him whatever befalls. Thank you, Hank. I'll hide back.